Welcome back to the Retro Vault, where we'll be looking at and diving into stories from games of old. PS1, PS2, Xbox, PS3, 360 era titles. In this installment we'll be returning to the PS1 era and looking at the story behind SCE Studios action adventure hack and slash game Medieval. Now there was a faithful remake of this game which came out back in 2019. It was a wonderful remake so if you can't get your hands on the original then give that one a go. However, in this video we'll be looking at the original game. Starting its development in 1995 in the good old UK, Medieval was originally to be named Dead Man Dan, a reference to the game's protagonist Sir Dan Fortescue. The game was heavily influenced by the work of Tim Burton, specifically The Nightmare Before Christmas, and I do feel that they nailed the look that they were going for. Interestingly, the game was originally slated to be a Windows and Sega Saturn arcade shooter, but Sony purchased the studio and the game morphed into the PlayStation title that we know and love and that was eventually released in 1998. The gameplay was interesting and very clunky, as was expected with games from this era, but players did have to battle with the camera along with frustrating tight sections of the game. Underneath this though was the gem of a video game with an interesting story to boot. Even though this game is now 25 years old, seriously where does the time go, there will be major spoilers in this video for Medieval. But let's dive in and explore the story. We should at first look at what was going on in Gallomir before the game's events took place. The story starts out in the 1200s, specifically in 1286, in the land of Gallomir, one of the nine kingdoms of Medieval Britain. A land of magic and dragons, the king over that land was King Peregrine, who ascended to the throne at age 15 after his father choked to death on an uncooked turnip. Gallomir was a beautiful place but something was brewing, a famine was looming as winter approached and the crops were dying. Peregrine ordered his court magician, his mage, Mazok the Muddled, to try and use magic to grow the crops, but this only gave birth to man-eaten pumpkin plants instead. To make things worse the king contracted gout, in order to try and save the kingdom from famine, King Peregrine turned to a strange magician, who not only brought back the plentiful crops to Gallomir, but also brought happiness back to the lands. This new magician became the king's hand, but something had happened to the king, a sadness and a befuddlement had come upon him. Anyway, this magician and the king's hand in question was a man named Zarok. When Zarok was a small boy, he had a puppy which he loved. One day the puppy ran after a cat, and his puppy was killed by a royal guardsman who was defending the king. This grew in Zarok a hatred for the king and his kingdom, and Zarok then turned to sorcery and necromancy, practice in which one communicates with the dead. Zarok was actually the one who killed off all the crops, giving him an in to get close to King Peregrine. It's also clear to see now where the king's sadness and decline had come from. So on to our protagonist. Daniel Fortescue was the son of a very wealthy lord, Cedric Fortescue. Daniel was a lazy, arrogant teenager, and he actually became a knight for one reason, not for honour, glory or to defend the kingdom, but to impress women. He was talented, but he was lazy. In the spirit of a true beneficiary of nepotism, Daniel rose through the ranks of the king's military thanks to his father's influence. Then one day, the captain of the army's horse was spooked by a toad, this was the work of Zarok, and the captain drowned after falling down a well. Zarok, fully aware of Daniel's laziness and incompetence, then advised the king to make Daniel the new captain of the army. After Daniel was made captain of the army, Captain Fortescue, the king told Daniel that a horde of 5,000 undead soldiers were making their way to Gallimere. So, Sir Daniel Fortescue led the king's army onto the battlefield. The demonic horde were being led by Zarok. Sir Dan gave a rousing speech and the battle began. But Sir Dan was the first man felled in battle, being killed, shot through the eye by the very first arrow. Very anticlimactic. Despite the death of Dan, the king's army won the battle. After the battle, King Peregrine was desperate to save face. It would have been embarrassing that his champion, the captain of the army, would fall so quickly without a single swing of his sword. People needed a hero, so King Peregrine made up a story that Sir Daniel Fortescue had not only died a noble death in battle, but that he had also killed Zarok. Sir Daniel was labelled the hero of Gallomir, and his body was placed inside a hero's tomb, and the books of history spoke of his courage, bravery, and sacrifice. Zarok was actually banished from Gallomir and went into hiding, preparing for his next attack on Gallomir. This now leads us into the events of the game. 100 years later in 1386, Zarok, having been in hiding, began his plan of attack. Zarok, shortly after Dan's death, had managed to procure a book of black magic along with something called a shadow artifact 
which is essentially a key to a tomb containing otherworldly demonic entities known as shadow demons. These shadow demons had helped Zarok build his castle in 1286 before they were imprisoned inside said tomb. But Zarok's plan was put on hold by the mayor of a town in Galomir called Gallows Town. You see, when Zarok was banished, he left behind the shadow artifact. The mayor stole it from him and he hid it. Naturally, Zarok wanted it back, so he turned up in Gallows Town. Using spells from the Book of Black Magic, Zarok plunged Galomir into Eternal Night and captured the souls of the people who lived in Gallows Town and used those souls to resurrect the dead in the town's cemetery and they became subservient to him. Unfortunately for Zarok though, he unwittingly revived the skeletal remains of Sir Dan, who awoke from his slumber. Not only that, but Dan kept a hold of his free will and he became the only one in Galomir who had a chance of stopping Zarok's invasion. However, he dusts himself off and stands up. He encounters a gargoyle which tells him that he should get his revenge on Zarok. So Dan leaves his crypt and ventures into the cemetery. He fights the undead that are serving Zarok and one by one collects the stolen souls that Zarok had stolen from the residents of Gallows Town. At the end of the cemetery, Dan finds a slimy green trail, a sign of Zarok's presence. Dan figures that he should follow this trail straight to Zarok. If Dan managed to collect enough of the souls in the cemetery, then he is transported to a place called the Hall of Heroes. The Hall of Heroes is a place where heroes go based on what they achieved in their life. Since Daniel was deemed to have failed despite the false stories told of his bravery, he doesn't have a place there. This is ultimately the motivation as to what would drive Sir Daniel in his mission to take down Zarok and earn his place amongst the heroes. Dan speaks to the person who is his second in command and his crossbowman, a young man known as Canny Tim, who was killed in battle by Zarok. Canny Tim gifts Dan with a crossbow the weapon he used to kill Zadok's second in command, Lord Cardok. Dan is then sent back on his journey to take out Zarok. He arrives at Cemetery Hill and spots Zarok, who isn't exactly pleased to see Dan. He sets two fire boulder spitting gargoyles on him, then retreats into the mausoleum behind him. Underneath the hill are caves, once inhabited by evil witches, and Dan finds and picks up one of the witch's old talismans. After collecting the souls from the area, Dan makes it to the top of the hill and enters the hilltop mausoleum. This place is inhabited by imps, small creatures that were once kept as household servants. A phantom organist would practice constantly, so the cheeky imps stole his sheet music and hid it. But the real attraction of the mausoleum is the stained glass window. On the window is the image of a demon. The stained glass demon who is described as the master of the mausoleum. Beneath the mausoleum, the actual demon is encased inside a frozen glass heart, and the demon is released after Dan shatters it with a flame. The demon confronts Dan and they fight. It's a fruitful fight for Dan as he defeats the demon which drops a key in the shape of a skull. Dan can now open a large gate which earlier was locked to him in the cemetery. So Dan goes to the gate and goes through it into a place known as Scarecrow Fields. Dan walks into the area and is immediately set upon by scarecrows which have also been animated by Xerox's black magic. They're very aggressive and Dan has to be really careful around them. Other hostile enemies are in the area, such as mad farmers who hide in the haystacks attacking anyone who passes by, imps operating machines built to steal crops from the farmers, and silent but very deadly creatures that hide and attack from within the crops called corn killers. But Dan does have an ally. Imprisoned inside the chest is a serpent called Kul Katura. King Peregrine's men actually imprisoned the serpent, thinking it was the evil serpent of Galamir, but they had actually imprisoned the serpent's brother, the friendly serpent lord Kul Katura. With the help of Kulkatora, Dan makes it through the cornfields and through various hazards and traps, and he ends up at the next place on his destination, Pumpkin Gorge. Remember I mentioned the man-eating pumpkins that were mistakenly created after trying to resolve the impending famine? Well, Dan is about to meet some of them. These vicious Kirkabitasai try to attack Dan. Despite being attacked from every angle, Dan makes it through the gorge and into another section of this spooky locale. There he fights against yet more vicious pumpkins, and using the previously found witch's talisman on a lone cauldron, Dan meets the pumpkin witch. She tells Dan that she's like a mother to the pumpkins. She says that they were once good natured and friendly, but that they fell under the influence of the evil pumpkin serpent king, a creation of, you guessed it, Zarok. The witch requests Dan's help to teach the big pumpkin a lesson and that in return she'll give him a gift. So Dan does indeed teach the big pumpkin a lesson by killing it. Afterwards, returning to the witch, Dan is rewarded with an item called a dragon gem, although what it's for, he doesn't know yet. From there, Dan journeys into the sleeping village, Gallows Town, which you'll remember is full of inhabitants who have had their souls taken by Zarok. As you can imagine, Dan is seen as hostile by the possessed townsfolk. This gargoyle also mentions that there are guards in the town loyal to Zarok, and that they are looking for an object of great power. 
These guards are boiler guards. They are literally living kettle boilers. In the village though, Dan finds a small church and it's missing its crucifix. A note from the mayor states that he knew Zarok's men were coming for him and that he has taken the crucifix from the church as it is the key to a key. Dan finds the golden bust of Mr. Shanks, the landlord of a pub called the Troll's Head, and he also finds a cast for a crucifix. He takes both to the blacksmith's forge and forges the crucifix using the bust as a source of metal. Going back to the church, Dan places the newly forged crucifix onto the wall of the church and a secret passage is revealed, which, true to the mayor's words, contains a key to a safe. Remember the shadow artifact? The key to the tomb containing the shadow demons? Well, that is the object of power that the guards are looking for. It turns out that the mayor, being a keen adventurer, happened upon the tomb of the shadow demons one day and he has the shadow artifact. So Dan goes to the mayor's house. Inside is a safe. Dan uses the key he got from the church and inside sits the shadow artifact. Dan then finds another note, this time from Zarok, ordering his men to capture the mayor and to take him to the asylum dungeons. So Dan sets out for the asylum. Dan arrives at the asylum grounds in search of the mayor and meets Jack of the Green. As well as being an insufferable moron, he's a master of riddles and the asylum grounds belong to him. Dan is effectively trapped in Jack's maze unless he can solve four riddles. He solves the first one, easy, no problem, then the second, third, and the fourth. By this point, Jack is very annoyed. Nonetheless, he grants Dan passage, and after he solves one final chess puzzle, he leaves the grounds and heads towards the asylum. Inside the asylum's dungeon, though, Dan is in a fight for his life, as he is once again attacked from every angle by the undead and crazy patients called headbangers. With the staff of the asylum gone, these patients, still in their straitjackets, are downright crazy. After defeating his violent attackers, Dan makes it to the cells, and there he finds the town mayor, and then frees him. He tells Dan that Zarok needed to release the demons from their tomb underneath the enchanted forest, and that he needs the shadow artifact in order to do it. After some waffling, the mayor thanks Dan, and Dan picks up another dragon gemstone and leaves for the enchanted forest. Arriving at the forest, Dan is welcomed by hostile plant life. Using the witch's talisman on another cauldron, Dan this time meets the forest witch. She has a request for Dan, for him to enter a place called the Ant Caves. She needs seven pieces of amber from the ant's nest. Again, she offers Dan a reward. So she shrinks Dan to a more appropriate size and he enters the nest. This place was actually home to beings called fairies. That was until the Ant Queen and her army of ants invaded and imprisoned the fairies. Dan collects the seven pieces of amber requested by the witch, but exiting the nest isn't that simple. Dan has to fight the Ant Queen. After defeating the queen, Dan receives his prize from the witch. A chicken drumstick? But this isn't any ordinary chicken drumstick. This one turns enemies into roast chicken that Dan can eat to regain his health. Anyway, Dan still has a job to do, so he pushes on through the forest. Dan finds an archway with something stopping him from passing through. But later on, Dan finds what he was looking for, the tomb. Dan opens the door to the tomb by using the shadow artifact. He enters and finds a note stating that he must take the shadow talisman that without it, he cannot pass through Shadow Demon territory. In order to do that, he needs to release the Shadow Demons. So, after stepping on some elemental stones, Dan releases the demons, but he also gets the talisman. He leaves the tomb and is lambasted by a nearby gargoyle for dooming them all. The gargoyle does, however, tell Dan that the Shadow Demons will be headed for King Peregrine's castle. So, you guessed it, Dan needs to head there next. Returning to the archway from earlier, Dan uses the Shadow Talisman and is now allowed entry. It's not all fun and games though, as Dan has to fight a couple of demons who are sisters called Demonettes. He defeats them both, and after fighting off all the shadow demons in the area, Dan makes it out of the enchanted forest. In order to get to the castle, Dan needs to head through the pools of the ancient dead. The pools are actually the location in which the Battle of Galomir took place, where Dan lost his life. Soon after arriving, Dan meets an old friend, a ferryman. He is Death. He explains to Dan that he can take him where he needs to go, but that in exchange, Dan needs to scour the battlefield to find eight souls. He finds them and on the journey through the pools, he fights the dead husks of fallen members of the king's army. Returning to the boatman, Dan gets his lift to a place known as the lake. This is Melomede, or at least it used to be Melomede. It's now a sunken town destroyed by a bunch of creatures known as Rhinotaurs. In Medieval Resurrection, Death mentions the massacre of Melomede. The truth is that the Rhinotaurs, which inhabit a cave system called the Crystal Caves, likely retaliated after miners from Melomede conducted an expedition which went wrong. As part of their revenge, the Rhinotaurs sank the town of Melomede. Anyway, the area is inhabited by hostile fish, 
watchful spies on the walls, and they summon entities known as the Guardians of Melomede. They perform ritualistic sacrifices to some elder deity. No guesses as to who that might be. Dan eventually discovers a massive whirlpool, and after journeying through it, gets what he needs in order to leave the sunken town of Melomede. His travels now take him to the Crystal Caves. As mentioned, the Crystal Caves are home to the Rhinotaurs. The shadow demons have passed through this place already, as Dan discovers, as he is forced to kill them. Dan ventures into the caves themselves, and he finds the Rhinotaurs are in hibernation inside the crystals, which allow them to prolong their lives. Dan fights his way through bats, Rhinotaurs, and imps, and eventually he comes to a large area. He finally figures out what to use his two dragon gems on. He places them into a statue of a dragon, and it awakens an actual dragon. This dragon, however, is clearly scared to death of the prospect of getting crushed by falling debris in the caves, so Dan uses that to his advantage, and using his hammer, he smacks the ground, causing debris to fall onto the dragon's head. Days confused and ever so slightly embarrassed, the dragon has had enough and grants Dan a potion which will adorn him with dragon armour which grants him the ability to resist fire damage and to breathe fire himself. In exchange for this, Dan will agree to leave the dragon alone. So Dan grants the dragon's request and leaves the caves. Dan then heads to a place known as the Gallows Gauntlet. This area is dangerous and full of death. It's inhabited by the undead remnants of executed criminals, and it's also home to the evil serpent of Galomir, who you'll remember was meant to be the one captured by King Peregrine's men. Using his new dragon armour, Dan is able to pass through an archway, a gate of fire, which would normally have cooked him straight back to death. Inside a new area, Dan takes out the evil serpent of Galomir, as well as freeing the souls in the area. After progressing through the gallows gauntlet, Dan leaves this forsaken area and pushes onto what used to be King Peregrine's castle. It's now known as the Haunted Ruins. Since Dan released the Shadow Demons, they've inhabited the ruins and have taken some poor farmer folk hostage, threatening to burn them alive. Dan makes his way through the ruins, defeating the Shadow Demons and frees the farmers. He ventures into the former throne room of King Peregrine, where he finds the King's Crown. Using the King's Crown, Dan is able to summon the ghost of King Peregrine, who tells Dan that the Shadow Demons are hiding beneath the castle, in the mountain, preparing their invasion of Galomir. You see, the castle itself was built on top of a once active but now dormant volcano. The only thing stopping the volcano from awakening is a sort of floodgate which is keeping the lava contained. The plan is to bring the castle down on top of the Shadow Demons, thwarting Zarok's second attempt at invasion. King Peregrine then transports Dan to an area with a lever, guarded by two stone golems, both of which Dan swiftly shunts off the edge. The lever opens the floodgates and Dan has to make a mad dash for a way out. He loads himself onto a catapult and fires himself over the castle walls. Dan lands in a wooded area, but a creature is nearby, a Jabberwocky, and it's hungry. A chase ensues, and after running, Dan is trapped. He stands at the edge of a very high cliff. However, he is saved by a huge vulture, which takes Dan upwards and into the skies whilst the Jabberwocky falls down off the cliff edge. The bird drops Dan off on a ghost ship, teeming with the skeletal remains of what used to be the ship's pirate crew. Of course, they see Dan as hostile, and the ship's captain wants Dan dead. Not much is gleaned as to what exactly happened to the ship and its crew, but Dan makes his way through the crew in the nightmarish obstacle course, finally making his way to the captain. Dan uses a couple of nearby cannons in order to defeat the captain, and commandeers the ship. Turns out that the ghost ship is very handy, as Zarok's lair is located on top of a tall mountain. Arriving at the entrance hall to Zarok's castle, Dan is greeted by a gargoyle, who tells him that Zarok isn't there. He's busy. The entrance is also guarded by lots of imps. Swiftly taking all of them down, Dan goes and finds Zarok's library, full of books on spells and necromancy. Dan exits the entrance hall and appears to stumble upon some sort of time device. He falls down into the device and ends up in the heart of the mountain. The area is guarded by boiler guards who attempt to stop Dan to no avail. He once again avoids hazards and uses the various time contraptions in order to open various gates, and this leads him to a train which will take him straight into Zarok's lair, and hopefully to Zarok himself. Dan activates the train and rides it to its destination. Arriving at Zarok's lair, Dan is greeted by another gargoyle which mentions the chalice. As you'll recall, I mentioned that Dan needed to collect the poor souls stolen by Zarok, and return them to the Hall of Heroes. As he progressed on his journey, each location gave him a chalice if he'd saved enough souls, and he was rewarded in the Hall of Heroes. The heroes included Canny Tim, Dirk Steadfast, Himanzi Shongama, Carl Sterngard, Megwin Stormbinder, Ravenhooves the Archer, Stanya Ironhewer, Woden the Mighty, and Blood Monoth Skullcleaver. They had all gained their place in the Hall of Heroes at some point, 
and they would reward Dan with various weapons and items to help him on his quest. Anyway, Dan enters the lair and places his chalice upon the shield inside the arena. Xerox appears and he calls upon his skeletal guard to surround Dan. This is where the chalice comes into play. The chalice summons eight of Dan's own guards and the two sides battle one another. Dan runs around restoring the health of his fellow soldiers with good lightning and eventually Zarok's guards are defeated. Zarok has another ace up his sleeve though. He summons and calls upon Lord Cardock, who you'll remember was killed in battle by Canny Tim. He rides in on his skeletal horse, but he too is no match for Dan who quickly dispatches him. Zarok has had enough and decides to get his hands dirty. He retreats into his laboratory and turns himself into some kind of serpent, and after a long and tough battle, Dan defeats Zarok. Zarok isn't going to let Dan get off easily though, and he tries to bring down the caves on their heads. A massive piece of rock crushes Zarok and Dan runs for an exit. The time device explodes, Dan is thrown over the edge, but Dan finds safety on a flying cog. He is then thrown off the edge of the cliff, but once again Dan is saved by the vulture. The vulture takes him back to his crypt, where Dan once again enters his eternal slumber. The possessed townsfolk are no longer under the influence and return to their normal selves. If Dan did collect all the chalices, he was rewarded with his place amongst the heroes, having done enough now to secure his place in the hall, and he along with the other heroes celebrate, and the game then ends. But the story doesn't end there. 